now talk about dispersion of light. Dispersion of light. You know that light is made up of thousands of wavelengths. Didn't we say that light is a form of wave? Yes. And the visible light, as we know, is made up of thousands of wavelengths, each corresponding to a different energy value. Now, if I allow this light to pass through a triangular prism like this, I actually showed it to you yes, in the last class. What will happen? Now, each wavelength is going to undergo different deviations. So, as the beam of light enters on one side, when that beam comes out, that beam is going to split so that we can see almost the individual colors. You can disperse. What does disperse mean? Disperse means to scatter. Is that right? So, light that is a coherent beam that contains all 3,000 different waves. When they are all together, you see it as white. But if you can separate them, you can see them as individual colors. So, what does dispersion mean? When light enters the prism and leaves it, each wavelength bends slightly differently resulting in the separation of colors. Now here I have a beautiful picture of it. I will not be able to show a spectacular demonstration like this. This is a beautiful picture. A white beam of light, white light entering one face of the prism. You can see it goes through the prism and comes out. It comes out in a dispersed manner. You can see red, orange, yellow, blue, green, violet. Isn't that beautiful? You have all those colors in there. And this process is called dispersion of light. Dispersion. All right. So light entering and this is the light coming out. It comes out in different colors. Light leaving the prism is dispersed, means it splits into various component colors. Now, a cloud consists of millions of raindrops, and each raindrop can act as a prism. So, have you seen the spectacular show, show on, see, on the horizon when there is cloud? If the sun is on the west side and if you have cloud on the east side, you will see a beautiful rainbow. Now, how is the rainbow formed? Each droplet of water in the cloud will act as a prism. And each of those prisms will disperse, will produce dispersion on the light that enters each of those. Now, this is what happens sunlight entering a droplet actually undergoes this kind of a deviation and you can see each time it enters the droplet and leaves it the the speed of each wavelength is different they will bend slightly different from each other that means they get dispersed so, you see the rainbow with red below and blue at the top. And in between, there will be other colors as well. So, when light passes through a raindrop, blue light is refracted more than red light. And the viewers see these colors at slightly different angles. Each color will be seen at slightly different angles and that's the reason why you see the rainbow. Now, multiple refractions separate the colors even more, giving the rainbow its spread of colors and brilliance. That's a beautiful sight in nature 
What is the cause? What causes it? It is the dispersion of light by the small droplets of water, each droplet acting as a prism. Now, look at this beautiful rainbow. Have you seen one like this? Yes. You see, nature has such spectacular sceneries for us. All right. Let's talk about the nature of light. Now, do you know when we started the discussion on light, we said we are on a journey to find out the nature of light. What is light? Now, have you been able to answer that question? What is actually light? Well, so far we said light is a form of wave. Now, but Newton, who studied light in detail, concluded that light is made up of tiny particles. And he called them corpuscles. So according to Newton, light is made up of very tiny particles. And each of that particle carries the definite amount of energy. Each particle is called a photon now. And Newton, Newton called it corpuscles. The red color has one kind of corpuscles. Blue color has different type of corpuscles. Energy value. Now, at the moment, we know them as photons. And each photon is an energy packet. Now, tell me, we talked about reflection, refraction, and so on, can particles, corpuscles, small particles, can particles undergo reflection? Yes, they can. Now, if you see a basketball player throws the ball off the glass, it gets reflected into the ring. Actually, that basketball will obey the law of reflection, angle of incidence equal to the angle of Angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection. So particles can be reflected. Can particles be refracted? When a particle goes from one medium into another, will the particle undergo a deviation? Well, try and throw a stone very fast into water. Will the stone go straight into water and keep the direction? Well, no. If you do that, you will see the stone will suffer a change in speed. As a result of that, the stone will undergo a deviation in its path. Now, in the last lesson or two lessons ago, I asked you about going on a bicycle on a good tarred road. If you come all of a sudden to a broken uh, gravel road, what's going to happen? Your speed is going to suddenly change. As the speed changes suddenly, what is going to happen to your direction? You're going to be thrown away from the road. You see? You will suffer refraction. So, refraction is possible with particles. Reflection is possible with particles. So all the phenomena that we have discussed so far can be explained using wave as well as particles. So both these theories of light, that light is made up of waves that we talked about early, and now Newton says light is made up of particles, both those are viable theories. All right, let's see if we can build on it. The properties of rectilinear propagation, reflection, and refraction of light are consistent with moving those fast-moving particles. Fast-moving particles will move in a straight line. They uh, obey the laws of reflection and refraction. All right, but... Light being a part of electromagnetic waves. We know that light is a part of electromagnetic waves. 
That means they have a frequency and wavelength. Now, do particles have frequency and wavelength? Well, that's a good question. Is that right? Well, the behavior of light is also consistent with the properties of waves. Light actually behaves like waves also. Light behaves like particles or corpuscles. Light also behaves like waves. Now, is there any experiment that we can do which will show that light behaves like a wave? Now, if we can prove that, does it mean that light is both particles and waves? So, if somebody asks you what is light, would you be safe to say that light is a form of particle motion? Also, light is a form of wave motion? All right, we need to answer that question. Is that right? All right, now let's, let me show you an experiment that some time ago in 1801, a scientist called Thomas Young performed an experiment and published evidence of a behavior of, that, of light that could be explained only on the basis of wave theory of light. So the experiment did by Thomas Young showed that light is a form of wave and this particular behavior of light could be explained only by using the wave theory not by particle theory. And what is that experiment? Let's look at the experiment uh, Young did. Now what he did is he allowed light to pass through two very closely spaced slits. Now what is that? Young allowed a monochromatic beam of light. What is a monochromatic beam? You see, the normal light, you know, is made up of 3,000 odd colors. It's a multiple combinations of colors. Monochromatic is a single color. So, he used for his experiment a single colored light. Why? He didn't want all the other colors to interfere to spoil his experiment. So, he used a monochromatic beam of light and allowed it to pass through two closely spaced slits. Now, this is what he did. This is a slit, and this is a slit very close to it, and he allowed the light to pass through both these, and then allowed the light to fall on a screen. Now, what did he observe? He observed that the brightness on the screen sort of showed variations. He found some places were very bright, very close to that, the place was sort of dark. See, the, the top part shows, this shows bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. Now, this is what he observed on the screen. Now, it is very difficult for me to show this uh, demonstration. But if you look here, we can see this is the kind of double slit that Thomas Young used. Can you see the two lines there? Well, this is the kind of double slit he used. And he allowed the light to pass through those two slits and caught that light on a screen. And he found, on the screen he found regions where the screen was very bright and then very dark, very bright, very dark and so on. Now, what can this be due to? Now, do you remember we talked about waves, sound waves producing beats? I demonstrated that to you. Now, how is that possible? We said two sound waves meeting at a point in phase. What does that mean in phase? The compression of one wave and the compression of the second wave meet together, producing a bigger wave. That means if two waves meet at a point in phase, 
you get a bigger wave, a bigger sound. And if two waves meet at a point out of phase, they cancel each other, you get no sound. So two sound waves meeting at a point can produce loud sound, no sound, depending on whether they meet in phase or out of phase. Now, in the same way, light coming from slit 1 and light coming from slit 2 meet on the screen here. If they meet in phase, there is a bright spot there. And next to it, if they meet out of phase, you get a dark region. So a bright region is where light from both slits arrive in phase. Dark regions are where light from both slits arrive out of phase. Now, so the intensity of the light, you had bright spot, dark spot, bright spot, dark spot, the bright spot is the region where light from both slits arrive in phase. Dark spot is regions where the light from both slits arrive out of phase. All right. Now, let me see if I can show you a demonstration of that. This is the experimental setup Young used. Now, here you have the double slit. This is the monochromatic source. The source, the light is going to come out of here. It will go through both these slits and fall on the screen. And what did uh, Young observe? At certain points on the screen, there were bright regions. There were other, other regions that were dark. Bright regions are where light from both slits will arrive in phase. Dark regions are regions where light from both slits arrive out of phase. All right, I'm going to turn it on and have a look. Okay, let's turn it on. And this is what actually Young observed. Now, look at that beautiful pattern you see there. I don't know whether it is going to be recorded properly. I'm hoping that it will. You got beautiful dark and bright bands. Now, a bright band is where the light from both these slits arrive in phase. A dark band is where light from both the slits arrive out of phase. And this tells me, or this kind of an experience, compelled Young to conclude that Light is a form of wave. Now, if light were made of particles, can particles going through one slit meeting with particles going through the other, can a set of particles put along with another set of particles produce no particles? Well, I will be surprised if that happens. If five apples in a basket if you put five more apples in there, can there be no apples there? Well, so obviously this shows that light is a form of wave motion. Well, let's uh, change the distance between the slits and see what happens. All right. Now, if the slit separation is made small, I think you can see this little more clearly now. You will see the dark, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright bands. All right? So, the double slit experiment conclusively shows that light behaves like waves. Isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? Yes, I think so. All right. So you can study by taking now. When the slit is just one piece, you don't see the dark and bright fringes. Only when you have two slits. Now, isn't that really great? Okay. 
let's uh, move on. This is another way of representing what Young observed. He allowed light to pass through these two slits and look at what was found on the screen. Dark and bright fringes. One, one more time. What does a bright fringe represent? A region where light from slit 1 and slit 2 arrive in phase. And next to it, they arrive out of phase. It is, uh, if you remember the two speaker that we played with in our sound lesson. If you keep two speakers and walk from one end of the room to the other, you will experience loud sound, no sound, loud sound and so on. Similarly, as you go from left to right, you get bright light, no light, bright light, no light. So, light waves behave like sound waves. That means this process called interference, one wave interfering with another wave, is a characteristic of wave motion. All waves exhibit that property, interference. Particles don't interfere and destroy each other, do they? If I put one particle with another particle, you don't see no particle there. So, this is quite a blow to the particle theory of light. Is that right? Right. Newton's theory of corpuscles suffered a blow when Young came up with this experiment. Okay. The only explanation for this observation is when lights arrive on the screen from two separate slits, they either combine to give more light or no light. And this is possible only if light is a form of wave. Two waves superimposed on each other can produce a larger wave or no wave depending on the phase difference. You know that. When they are in phase, they constructively interfere. When they are out of phase, they destructively interfere. So at points on the screen where the waves from both slits arrive in phase, there is more light due to constructive interference. And where they meet out of phase, there is no light due to destructive interference. Okay, let's now talk about another phenomenon associated with wave. Now, have we answered the question, is light a form of wave or is light a form of particles? Well, I'm going to throw this question every time to you. All right? I'll our aim is to answer this question eventually before the, the end of this class. Polarization of light, another characteristic of light. Now, this is again a phenomenon that can be explained only if light is a form of waves. Light is a form of electromagnetic waves with vertical and horizontal vibrations. Now, we have only seen wave where it will have one type of vibration. But actually, light consists of vertical vibrations and horizontal vibrations. Electromagnetic waves. There are electric vibrations and magnetic vibrations. So, light is actually a combination of vibrations in many planes. Now, in other words, the vibrations that constitute light can be represented like this. You have vertical, horizontal, and also vibrations in other planes. But, all other vibrations can be, we can actually summarize all these vibrations into this form. Vertical vibrations and horizontal vibrations. So as far as we are concerned, we are going to say light 
which is a form of electromagnetic waves, which are oscillations of electric and magnetic fields. And these oscillations come in all planes, but for our purposes, these oscillations or vibrations or variations are in the vertical and horizontal plane. All right. A polarized light waves are light waves in which vibrations occur only in one plane. If you can cut off one plane, in other words, if you can cut off the vertical vibrations, then you will only have horizontal vibrations. If you have a beam of light that consists of only horizontal vibrations, it is called horizontally polarized light. On the other hand, if you cut off the horizontal vibrations and you only have vertical vibrations, it will then be called vertically polarized light. So polarized light is light that consists of vibrations only in one plane. Now remember, if you cut off vibrations in one plane the intensity of light will will be reduced you see that you see the sunglasses you wear most people wear these expensive ray-ban glasses actually they are polaroid filters what do they do they cut off one vibrations only transmit vibrations in one plane so the intensity or the glare is cut down all right, the process of transforming unpolarized light into polarized light is known as polarization. So polarization is the, proce the process of transforming unpolarized light into polarized light. That means unpolarized light has vibrations in all planes. Polarized light will have vibrations only in one plane. The most common method of polarization involves the use of a Polaroid filter. A Polaroid filter. Polaroid filters are made of a special material that is capable of blocking one of the two planes of vibration of an electromagnetic wave. So a Polaroid filter is capable of blocking either the horizontal vibrations or vertical vibrations. It will only allow one vibration to pass through. Now when unpolarized light is transmitted through a polarized filter, what will happen? it emerges with one half of the intensity. You see, if unpolarized light is light that has vibrations in all planes, is allowed to pass through a polaroid filter, what comes out will only have half the intensity because half the vibrations are cut off. Is that right? Okay. Now here I have the unpolarized light, which has vertical and horizontal vibrations. And this is the polaro Polaroid filter. It will allow only vertical vibrations to pass through. It will cut off all horizontal vibrations. You can see what comes out is vertically polarized light. Now, here another illustration. This is unpolarized light, and uh, this is a vertical polarizer. It will allow only vertical vibrations to go through. And here I have a horizontal polarizer, which means it will not allow any vertical vibrations to go through. So what will come out there? Nothing will come out of it. So if you use two polarizing filters, one vertical, and one horizontal, it will cut off the light completely. Here is a good illustration of polarization, 
Watch this carefully. On your screen it may not appear very compelling, but uh, what you see here is unpolarized light. You can see red, blue and green. That shows vibrations in all planes. And it's going to pass through a vertical polarizer. When it goes through a vertical polarizer, vibrations in all other planes will be cut off only vertical vibrations are allowed to pass through and this is a vertical polarizer which will allow vertical vibrations to pass through so you have uh, what comes out is vertically polarized light now we can actually rotate these and see what happens when each of the polarized if the, each of the polarizing filters is uh, rotated. Let's have a look. Now let's rotate the first polarizer by 90 degrees. Well, let's rotate it uh, and make it vertical. You can see it is a vertical polarizer now. Let's go and make the second Let's make this filter a horizontal polarizer. What would you expect to happen? All right. There, this is now a horizontal polarizer. Means it will cut off the vertical vibrations. No vibrations now come out. This, the first one cuts off the horizontal vibration. And the second one cuts off the vertical vibrations. That means there is no light coming out at all. So, polarized light in one plane just has half the intensity. When you polarize it in both planes, there is no intensity left. Okay, let's uh, rotate it further and see what happens. All right, now rotate the first polarizer, what happens? When you make the first polarizer a horizontal polarizer, what comes out of it are all horizontally polarized light. But the second polarizer will not allow horizontally polarized light to go through. There is nothing comes out. So I hope you understand the meaning of horizontal and vertical polarization. Most of the sunglasses you wear are Polaroid filters. It will cut off vibrations in one plane. Okay, let's move on. The use of a Polaroid filter is not the only way to polarize light. Unpolarized light can also undergo polarization by reflecting from a non-metallic surface. So, refraction of light from a surface can also produce partial polarization. All right, here you can see unpolarized light hitting the surface and what is reflected is polarized light. That means some surfaces can actually cut off vibrations in one plane when light is reflected. A person viewing objects by means of light reflected off non-metallic surfaces will perceive a glare if the extent of polarization is large. Now, light reflected off water is actually partially polarized in a direction parallel to the water's surface. So, when light gets reflected from water like this, the, the light that is reflected will be polarized parallel to the surface of water. Fishermen know that the use of glare reducing sunglasses with the proper polarization axis will allow the blocking of this partially polarized light. You see, this light that is simply polarized horizontally, that is parallel to the surface of water, is very damaging to fishermen because you cannot... You see, that is a glare. Although the vertical vibrations are cut off, the horizontal vibrations will act as a glare. You cannot see 
through the water. If a fisherman can, cannot see through water, the fisherman cannot see any fish under water. So what you need to do is uh, wear proper sunglasses to cut off that horizontal glare. By blocking the plain polarized light, the glare is reduced and the fisherman can now more easily locate fish under the water. All right. Polarization can also occur by refraction. So refraction can produce polarization. Also refraction can cause polarization. When a beam of light is passed through a transparent medium, partial polarization will happen. The refracted beam acquires some degree of polarization, not total polarization, uh, perpendicular to the surface. Well, now tell me, we talked about interference, the Young's experiment, the double slit experiment. The only way you can explain the double slit experiment that is the variation of intensity, bright and dark bands of light can only be explained by using wave theory of light. Polarization of light can only be explained by using the wave theory of light. So does it mean that our question is settled once and for all? Light is a form of wave and we can go home and be happy about it? Well, there are other things to consider. There are other experiments using light has given us evidence otherwise. Now, the, the effect called photoelectric effect. I think I haven't uh, aligned that properly, so you cannot see it on the screen, can you? Photoelectric effect. Now, what is photoelectric effect? Photo stands for light, light producing electricity. Well, these days it is very common, we know that we can produce electricity from light. Solar panels, solar panels are very widely used to produce electricity. Now, what is this phenomenon of photoelectric effect? Let's spend a few minutes talking about that. The interference and polarization of light can only be explained using the wave nature of light. Now, this situation changed in 1905 when Einstein extended the photon picture to explain another phenomenon known as the photoelectric effect. It was Einstein who worked out the theory or photoelectric effect. Although Einstein is best known for his study on the theory of relativity, Einstein was given the Nobel Prize not for the study on relativity but on the study on photoelectric effect. Now what is this photoelectric effect? In this effect Light is shown on a metal. When light is allowed to fall on a metal, it was observed that electrons were released from the metal. So, this effect is called photoelectric effect. When light is allowed to fall on a metal, now this is a metal surface. When light comes and falls on the metal, the metal emits electrons. The metal throws away electrons. Now the question is, can a wave do this? How can a wave falling, now this is a metal surface, can light falling on this metal cause the emission of electrons from the metal if light is a form of wave? Well, let me ask you this. I have a basket full of golf balls here. How will I cause 
some of the golf ball from the basket to be ejected. Well, if I now throw a golf ball into the basket with some energy, the energy of the golf ball I throw can cause some of the golf ball in the basket to come out. You see? But if I send a beam of waves, can those waves go and knock off those golf balls? But it sounds very unlikely. So we are now going to go back to our particle theory of light. You see? Photoelectric effect. The only way we can explain the photoelectric effect is that light is made up of particles. And those particles are called photons. Now, here is a beam of light. A beam of light consists of large number of photons. Now, when these photons go and hit electrons in the metal, you can see the metal atoms has got positive charge and negative charge. And when these photons go and hit the electrons, the electrons can be given enough energy so that they can come out of the metal. You see, isn't that a good explanation? So, Einstein came up with an explanation of the photoelectric effect, which was built upon Planck's photon hypothesis. So, the hypothesis of light being made up of particles called photon was revived to explain this observation. Now, in this theory, Einstein assumed that photons have energy equal to the energy difference between adjacent levels of a black body. In other words, the photons carry enough energy so that it can go and knock off an electron from its orbital to outside the metal. And only a particle can do that. Now, when these photons hit the metal, they could give up some or all of their energy to the electron, sometimes causing the electron to, to be ejected from the metal. Now, there are a couple of observations that Einstein made and many people who repeated that experiment. Tell me, uh, which of the photons carry more energy? A photon that represents a violet light or a photon that represents a red light. Tell me which of the photons. We know that light consists of about 3,000 different wavelengths. And each wavelength is a color. So if you want to represent light by a packet of energy, you see a packet of energy is what our photons are. That means you have specific photons that represents red light and different kinds of photons that represents violet light. Which of these photons carry greater energy? Well, you know that violet light is much more energetic than red light. You see? So photons that represents violet light carry more energy. So which of these photons are more likely to knock off electrons from the metal surface? Red photons or violet photons? Well, obviously the one that carries greater energy. And experimentally it is observed that when you allow red light to fall on a metal, very few electrons, sometimes no electrons at all are emitted. But if you allow violet light to fall on a metal, many electrons are given off. Well, this is an indication that actually light is made up of these energy packets called photons. And the amount of energy carried by each of these photons determine whether an electron will be ejected or not. 
So all these are conclusive proof that light now has a particle nature. You can see here, I have a red photon and a green photon and a violet photon. Now, a red photon does not cause any emission at all. A green photon, yes, sometimes. But the energy of the electrons emitted is not very high. Whereas, look at the violet photon. It causes the emission of an electron when it falls on the metal surface. It causes an electron to emit with a tremendous velocity. You see, the velocity of the electron is 6.22 times 10 to the power of 5 meter per second. That means this violent photon that carries a greater amount of energy is more likely to eject electrons with greater energy. And this is the significance of photoelectric effect. Now, when you use a solar panel to produce electricity, this is actually what happens. When light falls on the, on the solar collector, electrons are made or knocked off. Now, causing an electric current, it is the electric current produced by the, the motion of electrons there that causes that effect. All right. Now, the energy of a photon, which I, I, so far I have been saying energy of a photon is a packet of energy. Now, this packet of energy is a specific amount of energy. And now, the energy of an electron is represented, the energy of a photon, not electron. The energy of a photon is represented as H multiplied by F. Now, H is a mysterious number. It is called the Planck's constant. And F is the frequency of the photon. The frequency of a violet photon is greater than the frequency of a red photon. That means the energy carried by a violet photon will be greater than the energy carried by a red photon or a green photon. All right? This is useful to remember. The energy of a photon, a photon is an energy packet. The energy of a photon is H times F, where H is called the Planck's constant and F is the frequency of that photon. Well, did I say the photon has a frequency? But isn't frequency associated with a wave? Well, now look where we are now coming. All right, I will be there with you in a minute. So a higher intensity light has more photons. Now don't confuse between intensity and the frequency. Intensity is how many photons are coming in. However, if the frequency of the light is such that a single photon is not energetic enough to release the electron, that is in the case of red, then none will be ejected no matter how intense the light is. You can use a ve very high intensity red light, no electrons will be emitted. But a very low intensity violet light will cause emission. So, now, shall we put all these things together? I don't know whether you can actually see what I have on the screen. Dual nature of light. What does that mean? Dual nature. Light seems to be dual natured. Well, a lot of behavior of light can be explained using the particle nature of light. Is that right? The, the behavior of light that is rectilinear propagation, reflection, refraction, photoelectric effect we just discussed, all these can be explained using the particle nature of light. 
but the interference diffraction and so on those properties polarization these behavior of light can be explained only using the wave nature of light and so can we arrive at a conclusion what is the nature of light is light particles or waves now the present day understanding is that all particles are wave-like. In other words, the quantum mechanics which has built up the whole of physics in the past 100 years has played a great role in explaining all these controversial aspects. Now, according to quantum mechanics, every particle behaves like a wave. That means the photon that we are talking about that makes up light actually is a packet of waves. What we were talking about so far as a photon, a packet of energy, is actually a packet of waves. It's a wave packet. So particle behaves like waves. Though that means there is no controversy. Light can behave like particles and light can behave like waves. Why? Because particles are waves, waves are particles. You see, you and me and the camera and the computer all are waves. We all have wavelength and frequencies. Do you believe me? Well, that is true. But because we are so big, the wave nature is not very apparent. But when you go deeper and go into the smaller world of electrons, protons, photons, the particle and wave nature can be interchanged for one to the other. You know, it is very difficult to distinguish between a particle and a wave. So, is light a wave or a particle? Your shadow, when you stand in the sun, suggests that light consists of particles moving in a straight line. Is that right? If two thick glass plates are pressed together with a little water in between them, fringes caused by interference of light could be seen like this. Now, that's something actually you can produce. Try and see whether you can actually see it. Now, it may be difficult for me to show it to you on a camera, but you can actually do that. I will show you how to do it. It is rather difficult for the camera to pick up those fringes. Here I have two thick glass pieces and I have a small bit of water in there. And I can actually see, when I look, I can see beautiful fringes there. And how is those fringes possible? Those fringes are possible because light that is reflected from this region is reaching my eye out of phase I see this as dark whereas light reflected from here are reaching me in phase you see a light out of phase produces dark band light meeting in phase produces light that is bright light you see what what happens is your, your eye will get two beams of light. One reflected from the top glass, the other reflected from the bottom glass. You see, if those two light beams or light waves are in phase, you see this bright band. If they are out of phase, you see the dark band. Now look at that beautiful picture of but I can actually see those bands. They are quite colored. Now, try this on your own. I'm sure you will be able to see 
those fringes. Now, what does this suggest? This suggests that light is a form of wave because only waves can produce this effect. Are we therefore ready to answer our question? Well, particle theory could explain reflection, refraction, and photoelectric effect. Wave theory could explain the interference and polarization of light, which particle theory could not. So now our task, or the task of a scientist, physicist, is to bring it all together to come to a compromise theory. And the compromise theory is actually worked out by the quantum theory. What did I say the quantum theory suggests? Quantum theory assigns wave nature to every particle. In other words, wave nature is inherent to all particles. But that becomes apparent only when the particle is very, very small, like electrons and protons or photons and so on. Now, Niels Bohr in 1928 offered his complementarity principle. Now, that is the principle which actually brought these two controversial theories together, the particle theory and the wave theory. So, Niels Bohr came up with the complementarity theory that particle theory and wave theory are actually equally valid. There is no need for us to fight over it. Both will win. Scientists should simply choose which of a theory works better in solving their problems. In other words, when you are working with photoelectric effect, only particle theory will work, use that. When you work with interference and polarization, only wave theory will work, use that. One complements the other. There is no controversy here. Now, the currently accepted theory of light is the quantized electromagnetic field or quantum electrodynamics. Now, this theory was actually developed in the 1970s. Richard Feynman worked on this. Actually, uh, Richard Feynman got his Nobel Prize. He was a physicist in Caltech. He got his Nobel Prize uh, working on QED, quantum electrodynamics. Now, this theory merges particle and wave theory into a single theory. There is no distinction between particle theory and wave theory. All particles have wave nature. Now, look at this. An electron, here's an electron coming. The moment it passes through these slits, it behaves like a wave. So, until now it is a particle, now it is behaving like a wave. Now, this is what quantum mechanics says, that all particles have wave nature, including you and me. That means two of us can meet together and annihilate each other, produce nobody. Destructive interference. Well, that is visual thinking. Is that right? But the dual nature is valid only at subatomic levels, at a very low, uh, well, at the, where the dimensions are very, very small. So this clearly explains the dual nature. Particles and waves are two faces of the same thing. Light can behave like a particle or it can behave like waves. Well, I think we discussed quite a lot on light and we settled the question on the nature of light, didn't we? Okay, I hope you have a clear picture now of wave motion and light. We are now ready for the unit three test. So please go through your practice test. Make sure that you do all the homework. And I hope all of you have been sending me your assignments. 
Now, that's not too much of work. I just ask you to do a couple of questions uh, to be sent to me regularly as assignment and the lab exercises. So keep your work up to date, that's very important. And take your test before it expires, all right? We will meet for unit four later on.